Hello world. Today, let's talk about 10 built-in Python functions that are pretty useful and that you shouldn't miss out on. For those of you who are unfamiliar, built-in means that we do not need to install any external library using pip to use these functions. Number one, pprint. So to use this, we have to import it first from pprint, import pprint. And what this function does is that it prints complicated data structures in an automatically formatted manner. For example, let's say I have this dictionary over here. And if I just print it normally, I'm going to get this output. So here, everything is on one line. However, if I choose to use the pprint function, I'm going to get this output instead. So notice here that our printer output is actually formatted for us. In addition, we can add the indent keyword, and let's say indent is 4. And if we run this, we will get this. So notice here that we have an indent of 4 spaces. Number 2, the zip function. So essentially, the zip function allows us to iterate through 2 or more things at once. So let's say we have two lists, L1 is equals to apple orange pear, and L2 is equals to 4, 5, 6. And let's say we want to iterate through both lists at the same time. So I'm going to do it first without using zip. So I'll probably do something like this for i in range length l1. And here, fruit is equals to l1 i and price is equals to l2 i. And here, I print both fruit and price. And if I run this, I will get this output. Apple 4 orange 5, and pair 6. So next, I'm going to use the zip function to simplify this. So I'm going to comment this out first. So for fruit price in zip L1 and L2, I'm going to print fruit and price. So if I run this again, I will get the same output. So notice that our zip keyword here will actually iterate through both of these lists at the same time. Also, note that we can iterate through three or more things at the same time also. So let's say we have another list, L3 is equals to 5, 6, 7. And let's say L4 is equals to A, B, C. So let's say we want to iterate through all four at the same time, and we can do that using zip2. Let's say X and letter. So X and letter. And if we run this, we will get this output. So one thing to note about zip is that it will stop when one of the lists reaches its limit. So let's say we only have apple and orange here. And if we run this, it will stop at apple and orange only. Number three, enumerate. So when we use enumerate to iterate through a list, it will allow us to generate both the index and the element at the same time. So let's say I have a fruits list and it contains apple orange pear. And let's say for some reason, I need both the index and the element at the same time. So I'm going to do this first without enumerate. So I'll do it like that for i in range length fruits. Fruit is equals to fruits i. So I index the fruits list and then I print both i and fruit at the same time. So if I run this, I will get this output. Zero apple, one orange, and two pear. So next, I'm going to do this using enumerate, and I'm going to comment this out. So for i, comma, fruit in enumerate, fruits, green, i, comma, fruit. And if I run this, I'm going to get the same output. So notice here that the enumerate function will allow us to not have to deal with the range, length, and the indexing over here. Number four, the. So the the function, which is essentially short for a directory, will return a list of attributes of an object. So we can use it to inspect what methods or attributes an object has. So let's say we have a string, so apple, and let's say we want to check what methods a string has. So we can do this print the x and if i run this we'll get a whole bunch of stuff 
So all of these are either methods or attributes of a string object. So now let's say I change x to a list instead. So one, two, three. And if I run this once again, I'll get the attributes and methods of a list. So this the method can be pretty useful if we want to quickly check what methods and attributes a certain object has. And this is especially useful if the original documentation sucks. Number five, time.sleep. So this time.sleep function essentially makes our Python program go to sleep and do nothing for a set amount of time. So I'm going to use it like that from time import sleep. So here, let's just print apple. And after printing apple, we sleep for three seconds. And after sleeping, we print orange. And let's see what happens. So here we print apple and now we are sleeping for 3 seconds and finally orange is printed. So I find the sleep function the most useful when I'm doing web scraping stuff. Usually I need to make my program idle for a bit to avoid the server detecting me as a bot. Or perhaps I need to wait for certain javascript stuff to load in my web scraping script. Number 6. Sorted so here, the sorted function allows us to create a sorted copy of a list or some other iterable. So let's say I have a list of numbers 2, 5, 3, 1, 4. And I want to sort this list. So I can simply do this. x is equals to sorted list. And if I print x, x will be sorted for me. And here we have it, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Also, Note that our original list will not be touched. So if I run this again, x will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but our original list, which is LIS, will be 2, 5, 3, 1, 4, which is its original state. Also, let's say I have a slightly more complicated list. Apple and 4, orange and 5, and pear and 2. So if I run this normally, I will sort by alphabetical order, so we still get apple, orange, and pear. However, let's say we want to sort by the number behind. So our sorted can take in a condition. So key is equals to condition. So here, the condition must be a function. And since we haven't defined our function, let's do that now. So define condition. So it takes in an element. And it returns the thing that we want to sort the element by. So the element here will be an entire tuple, and since we want to sort by the number behind the tuple, we return element minus 1. So this minus 1 will refer to the number behind our tuple. So if we run this once again, we will get this. So pair 2 is in front, followed by apple 4 and orange 5. And note that this is sorted by the number behind the tuple, 2, 4, then 5. So another thing to note is that if we want to keep our code compact, we can actually replace our condition with a lambda function. So here, lambda x x minus 1. So this is the equivalent of writing the condition function. So if we run this again, we will get the same output. Number 7 is instance. So this function allows us to check if an object is an instance of a certain type. So note that this doesn't just allow us to check an object's type. So to illustrate this better, let's define a bunch of classes. So here, I have an animal class, and the animal class has a child class called dog, and the dog class has a child class called German Shepherd. So here, I'm going to create a German Shepherd, German Shepherd, and I'm going to print is instance rocky a dog so i'm asking is rocky a dog so here rocky is a german shepherd but since a german shepherd is a dog rocky is also a dog and this will print true so let's say is rocky an animal so here a german shepherd is a dog and a dog is an animal so therefore a german shepherd is an animal and this will also print true. And here, if I replace animal with object, this will print true too. So in Python, if we have a class that does not inherit from anything, by default, it will inherit from object. 
So an uh, animal is an object. So this will also print true. However, note that if I initialize Rocky as a dog and I check whether it is a German Shepherd, this will print false because Rocky is a dog, but it is not necessarily a German Shepherd unless, of course, we define it to be so. Number eight, os.lister. So this function allows us to list all of the file names within a certain folder. So let's say we have a folder named test. So let's create test and let's create a bunch of files inside a.txt and b.txt. So here we can import os and we can use the lister function to check what is inside our test folder. So x is equals to os.lister and we put test and let's print x and let's see what happens. And here we have b.txt and a.txt. So essentially, this list the function will list all of the files that are inside this test folder. So similarly, instead of using tests, if we just pass in nothing, we will list everything that is inside this current directory, which is essentially Jupyter, test, a.py, and b.py. And here we have it, we have test, a.py, b.py, and Jupyter. Number nine, OS walk. So this is an upgraded version of os.lister, but it is harder to use. So going back to our previous example, what if we have a funny multi-nested dictionary? So let's create a bunch of stuff inside test. So test two, and inside test two, there is test three, and inside test two, there is c.txt, and inside test three, there is d.txt. So here, if we simply use os.lister, we will only get test two, a.txt and b.txt. So let's try. Import os and print os.lister test. And if we run this, we will get b.txt, a.txt, and test2. However, we do not know what is inside test2. So if we want to deal with a multi nested directory, we need to use os.walk. So let's do this. So for root subfolder and file names, in os.walk test let's print root subfolder and file names and if we run this we will get this output so essentially os walk will recursively walk through everything that is inside this folder so here we have b.txt and a.txt and under test slash test 2 we have c.txt and under test slash test 2 slash test 3 we have d.txt and so if we want to list every single file path, we can do this for file name in file names, print f string root slash file name. And if we run this, we will get every single file inside test. So essentially, if we have a multi-nested directory, I usually use OS walk to check for the stuff inside. Number 10, random.renrange. So here, random.renRange allows us to generate a random integer. So from random, import range, and x is equals to range. let's say 1 to 10. So here, I put 1 to 11 because 11 is actually excluded. So this will generate a random number from 1 to 10. And if we run this, we will simply get a random number, and if we run it again, we will probably get a different number. 3, 1, 2, 1, 1, 5, and so on. Also, note that there are other useful functions from the random library which is built in, so we do not need to install anything else. So let's say random. So I'm going to remove random range and I'm going to put random. So random will simply return a random float between 0 and 1. So 0 0.935, 0 0.525, 0 0.420, and so on. And if I use choice instead, so I'm going to get this choice, and I'm going to take in an iterable. So let's say I have a list. So first, let's define a list. List equals to apple, orange, pear. So choice will select a random choice between apple, orange, and pear. So if I run this, we'll get apple first, pear, apple, apple, pear, orange, and so on. 
another useful function would be sample. So let's say I have more fruits, pineapple, durian, and here I'm going to use sample. So let's say sample of three. So the sample function will allow us to select a random sample of an iterable. So here I'm going to select a random sample of size three. So if I run this, I'm going to get pear, orange, and pineapple. And if I run it again, I'm going to get another random sample. Orange, durian, and pineapple, okay? And if I run again, I'm going to get pear, apple, and durian, and so on. So thanks for watching, and hopefully you have learned at least one new thing about Python today.